Okay, a pastor and a politician, I do this every time, it's good. A pastor and a politician died, and all of a sudden they go to the pearly gates, St. Peter welcomes them in. So they give the pastor a, a set of keys to his efficiency uh, apartment, and then they give the politician the keys to a deluxe suite. And the pastor says, what's wrong, St. Peter? I have given my life to you, I've served, I've done everything you asked me to do. And, and St. Peter said, hey, listen, this is the first politician we've seen. <laughs> Just joking, it's okay. Just wanted to break the ice a little bit. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Baker, and he's going to get up and uh, tell you all that you need to know. Alright guys, again, thank you for coming out, especially on campus. We appreciate you guys being here. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the forum and how, how it's held, it's going to have each candidate will have two minutes to do their question and you know answer and a minute to introduce themselves and the order is going to be first Miss Betty Insinger and second Miss Terry Seafelt third Dr. Randy Wilson fourth Miss Purcell and fifth Miss Jennifer Sullivan and again we'd like to thank you guys for coming out and uh, let's get started okay Miss Betty Insinger your first question. Why are you most qualified to serve as our state representative? Are we doing an introduction first? Oh, I, I apologize. <laughs> Please do your one-minute introduction. Are we on? Yes, you should be. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> I am Betty Hensinger, and of course I'm a candidate for District 31. I have three sons, um, and I've been married to my husband, Bill Pixley, for 30 years. I've been in business for myself since 1982, first as an advertising marketing executive, then an added value manufacturer. I partnered with companies from Germany and Israel, and then a realtor broker and a broker associate. I have lived the last eight years of this realtor expansion, real estate expansion, and then the economic bust, so I believe I have a skill set that is unequaled by my opponents. I think that I understand what it takes to negotiate through um, what we have gone through, and I am here to ask for your vote. I hope that you'll vote for me in 2014. complicated issues and explain them to the masses. The most recent being the Obamacare bill. I've spent the last three and a half years traveling all over the state of Florida trying to warn people about the devastating effects of this health care bill. I've sat on panels with physicians, with Senator Hayes, with Senator Nagron, with university professors and uh, hospital representatives. I've testified before the House and Senate special subcommittees on health care reform on behalf of my industry. I've even been asked to teach continuing education, not just to the insurance profession, but to CPAs, medical device, or excuse me, uh, to CPAs, uh, human resource managers, and uh, medical coding society. And I look forward to taking some of that experience and going to Tallahassee and representing all of you. My name is Terry Seafelt. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Good evening and thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Randy Glesson and I'm a uh, business owner and a, I'm a chiropractic physician. Uh, my family has been in Lake County uh, since I was two years old. Um, I attended the Eustace school systems. I went to Lake Sumter Community College and then on to the uh, Palmer College of Chiropractic where I received my Doctor of uh, Chiropractic degree. After graduation, uh, I would probably <coughs> return home to my hometown uh, here to practice with my dad, Dr. Jim Glisson. In, uh, in 1993, uh, my father and I <coughs> co-founded Lake Healthcare Center, which is a multi-specialty clinic that has family medicine, chiropractic, and podiatry 
uh, departments, and we've proudly been uh, helping this uh, community for for 50 years. Uh, I've also proudly served on the uh, Florida Hospital Waterman Board Foundation as chair. I've chaired the Florida Chiropractic uh, Board of Medicine, and I also uh, have proudly given back to this community uh, through the years through uh, foundations and civic organizations. Uh, I also am a deacon at the <coughs> Street uh, Baptist Church, and I've recently been asked to serve on the uh, Florida, excuse me, on the Christian Athletes uh, Association, the Florida Association of uh, Christian Athletes. So, with that, uh, thank you for having us this evening. Good evening, and thanks so much to the students and student government here at Lake Prep and the faculty and staff for their support. You are certainly to be commended for your interest and your participation in our electoral process. I also want to welcome and greet and say hello to the other candidates here. There are six of us in the race right now and a, and a Democrat just joined and if many more people join this group we're going to be debating in an auditorium or in a gym. Um, I am B. Grassle and I am a candidate for District 31. I am a registered nurse, a guidance counselor, and as a woman of faith, I'm a parish nurse and elder in my church. I think the issues here in, in District 31 are the economy, education, <coughs> and the environment. And I think we need to work on those interrelated so that we can decrease um, unintended consequences by fixing one and hurting another one. I believe in data-driven advocacy. I don't shoot from the hip. I do my homework. I'm a moderate conservative. I believe in uh, the motto from Habitat from Humanity, for Humanity, which is a hand up, not a hand out. Thank you very much. Well, good evening. I first want to start by too, thanking Liberty Prep for hosting this event, for Tabitha and Andrew working together with the student body government. Thank you for taking an active role and interest as someone of from your generation. It is so encouraging to see y'all stepping up and being a part of the process because that is vitally important in order to keep Florida the incredible state that it is for us to continue together pushing forward. Well, my name is Jennifer Sullivan and I've grown up here in Lake County. I've been a part of the community from the beginning, and I've served in 4-H, my local church, and I'm on the board currently of the Republican Party here in Lake County and have been working diligently there since 2008. For the past four years, I've worked as a youth development leader for Team Hack Leadership School, which teaches youth to understand the political process, value the Christian faith, value liberty and engage the culture. That's what I've been doing and that's what I would like to continue to do as your state representative. I look forward to discussing things this evening and I thank you all for being here. Okay, so now for the question portion of the forum. But before I sign over, I'd like to ask each candidate that you respect the uh, time clock or else you will be interrupted. We just didn't want to interrupt your introductions. But uh, as I said before, you'll have two minutes for, to answer each question. And uh, Ms. Hensinger, you are first. Your question is, why are you most qualified to serve as our state representative? You may begin. I think that I am most qualified in the fact that I have spent the most of my working life learning how to um, develop a business, pay a paycheck, and to keep that business sustainable. And I think also, in doing that, you learn how to be a good negotiator and a good taskmaster and have great time management skills. It's not easy to work 24-7, especially when you're going through economic downturns, to not realize that there's give and take, but also to stay real principled to everything that you do, whether you're doing it for the district or for yourself or for your family. And I have been able to do that all of my life, um, in my working life. Of course, I've raised three sons, so that in and of itself gives me an advantage uh, in some respect because it's not easy raising teenagers in today's world. And I commend you all for being here tonight and being part of the process because I think it's really great to see young people uh, step up to it. 
But I do think that when you have life experiences that have and encompass not only what goes on in Lake County, but in the world, you have a different perspective and you take that perspective and those life experiences with you and it helps you to understand issues from a different level. So I think that I therefore am the best candidate for this um, seat. Thank you. Next, Ms. Terry Siebel. You may begin. Thank you. Um, I too have been a business owner in the past. I had an insurance agency years ago, which I sold, and I spent uh, the last 25 years being very involved in my profession, which is the insurance profession. And ours is a highly regulated profession, as you might have gathered at recent events with the U.S. insurance industry. And I've spent the last 18 years as a citizen advocate going to Tallahassee with my industry, talking to regulators, talking to legislators, explaining why bills are good, why bills aren't good, and how they could do things to make it better for the consumer. And I've learned as a citizen that you can make a difference. You know, having a relationship with your legislator, being able to articulate the issues, you can make a difference just as an average citizen. And after doing this for the last 18 years, I would like to take those experiences and, and do it on a grander scale for, on behalf of the people of Florida and District 31. Um, I've, I've also had a lot of great experiences. My, my primary client are business owners, and I've been working with them for 14 years in this business. I see the devastating effects of the economy on them, where they're paying out of their own pockets to keep the doors open. They're being, being told by a president that you didn't build it, and, and it, and it hurts them, you know, because they're trying really hard to keep it going. Uh, I've seen them have to make really hard decisions about their personnel because of the Obamacare bill. You know, they're looking, do I, do I raise my prices, do I sell off parts of my company, or do I reduce people's hours and know that that's going to hurt their family? I feel like I have very good ideas of what it takes to, to build an economy. To, to put food on the table for people, and I feel that I would be a great, I, I hope you could too, but it's up to you ultimately, but I feel like I could do a great job for this pe the people of this city and of this county, and I would appreciate consideration. Thank you. Um, I feel that I would be the most qualified uh, to represent uh, this district in the uh, Florida State House of Representatives as a business owner um, that has to provide for 18, 18 employees every week a paycheck, uh, as a business owner that's responsible for helping provide uh, benefits for all of those employees, uh, as a business owner who on a, on a weekly basis deals with uh, state regulations that, uh, that I constantly have to, to deal with. Uh, paying taxes as a business owner. I mean, from the ground up, you, you as a business owner, as a small business owner, you see how uh, how uh, how things are run. Uh, also, as a physician, uh, I proud myself as a chiropractic physician that I have good listening skills. Uh, for the past uh, 27 years, I've, I've been in a been in an office every day where I've, I've literally treated thousands of patients and, and listened to, to their problems and tried to, to help them with their health care. So uh, encompassed with the fact of being a business <coughs> owner and a physician, uh, I hope and uh, believe that my experience would, would truly benefit those in House District 31. <laughs> Very background. I have uh, started out at Lake Country Community College and got an associate degree in nursing, became a registered nurse, and then got a bachelor's of science degree in uh, nursing, bachelor's of science nursing in Florida Southern, and then went to Troy State and got a master's of science in counseling and psychology. And education is fine, but you have to do something with that. And we share with you experiences that I've had using that education. Um, I taught for a number of years at Lake Tech, uh, used to be the old Low Tech, if you remember back that far, in the Health Occupations Department. And I saw students, adult students, coming in that had, were underemployed, unemployed, the businesses had gone bankrupt, 
and they were looking for another job. And it was my job to try to help them build their self-confidence and their self-esteem and their skills so that they could become marketable again. I also spent time as a registered nurse working at a hospital um, life stream behavioral center, an in inpatient psychiatric facility. And, um, <laughs> and it showed me that we really need to work together. Um, I have a lot of decision-making skills. I worked as a, a, a guidance counselor in an elementary school, middle school, and Lake Hill Center School for handicapped children. And then I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to work for our Florida Education Association and represent teachers, not only in Lake County, but throughout the state. And it showed me and gave me the skills to collaborate. During that time, I have gone to Tallahassee since 1989 advocating for health care, for patients, and for teachers and for education, and I'd like to use all of that to help you be your voice in Lake County. Thank you. Although my, my age may deceive you in thinking that I haven't had very much life experiences or that I haven't had many jobs, I assure you that that is not the case. I started working first when I was eight years old for my granddaddy, who was an artist, and traveled the country. And that's where I learned my hard work ethic. The older generation had it right. They know what it's like to roll up their sleeves and truly work hard and diligently. And that's how my life started. Since then, I've worked in childcare, youth development, agriculture, and sales, as well as hospitality. I know what it's like to be working two jobs, to have to meet your expenses, I may be young, but my parents made sure that I worked for what I had. And I'm so grateful to have the work ethic that I do have. I think that in Tallahassee, we need people who understand the role of government, as well as has experience. It's interesting that you ask what makes a candidate qualified. Because to be honest, qualified can be a very relative term. Does having a certain degree make you qualified? Does having a certain political office on a local level make you more qualified? Does having 20 more years at a business make you more qualified? I think that answer is up for you to decide what you want in your candidate. But I'll tell you what you'll get with me. You'll get someone who understands the role of government, who's someone just like you, who knows what it's like to work hard, to have government take a lot out of your paycheck, and to have to provide. There are many things that are in our, pardon me, in our state government, we need more people that have you in mind, and I will have you in mind. We have many people that go up who have special interests that they represent, and we need someone for the people, by the people, to represent the people. And I think that's what makes me qualified, because I understand the role of government and will represent you. Again, thank you, candidates. For your next question, we'll be answering what do you think was the main cause of the government shutdown and how could it have been avoided? We're back with start of the order, so Ms. Kinsinger, you will be good. The main cause to the government shutdown, uh, I think, probably had to do with something that Jennifer was saying that the people have a lot of self interest and their own interests, and they're not looking out for the people, and they're not paying attention to what the people's needs are on our level, certainly not the county level. But mostly, I think it comes down to um, the fact that they were um, trying to debate on Obamacare and get it off of the table from one side, and they also were trying to debate the debt ceiling, as the debt ceiling has more than doubled on the last six years. So I think that. Uh, in that respect, we just need to um, realize that the debt ceiling is probably one of the main crises that is facing our nation right now. And I think that there are many Republicans in both the House and the Senate that are realizing that that is the crippling effect of what's happening to our country and to our workforce and our employment. So I think that um, mostly, though, I actually, if I came to the real root cause, I would say a lot of it had to do with political posturing that were causing it more so than not. And I think that 
the bad news is for Republicans, it painted us with a, a different hue than perhaps I would like or perhaps we would like in the fact that we were painted as the party that was shutting down the government. So I think that in the, in the future, we're going to have to really look. I think that it's been shut down 18 times since President Carter. I think it was President Carter that started this um, back in his term of office as a way to uh, deal with the budget issues. And I don't see if the Senate's not going to pass the budget where we are actually working with restraints. I don't see us not going through this one more time. I think we've just kicked the can once again down the road. So I think that um, we're going to have to deal with it again in January and February. Here, there's a lack of growth in the economy. Their solution is always by raising taxes or, or imposing government solutions. Where, where the Republican Party tends to be the party, I believe, of personal responsibility and freedom. And when you approach solutions to problems from such different vantage points, the free market solution versus government solution, it's hard to find middle ground. And, and years ago, um, in 2010, when they had a big sweeping changes in, in the uh, government, Anyone that was a moderate Republican got booted out. Anyone that was a moderate Democrat got booted out. And, and sadly, some of those people were the bridge makers between, between those two divides. And they're not there anymore. And so, so now we have two, two cultures up there that are very far apart and, and they have a hard time finding a middle ground. And there's no bridge makers for them. Um, I do believe that the Republicans tried very hard to present a ton of options. They, they had, they kept, reducing their, their demands every day, every day, but they're dealing with a president who refused to negotiate with them and would rather put the American people through what he did for the last two weeks. It was sinful, I, I believe. Making veterans, you know, blocking them from their memorials, not paying for the, the soldiers when they came back at Dover Air Force Base. It, it was really sinful what, what happened to the American people. And I was really disgusted today on the radio when I was driving to a meeting I heard the president say, well, the last two weeks have shown the American people how important government is to them. <laughs> Did you hear that on the radio? That's what he said. The last two weeks have shown the American people how important the federal government is to them. And that's very scary to me. Um, well, I certainly uh, think there were some good points that have already been made, but I think Essentially, it was uh, two issues, and I think this was uh, our fellow uh, Republicans' final, uh, my fellow Republicans' final attempt to stop Obamacare. And Obamacare is, as a physician, it is going to change uh, the way uh, doctor-patient relationships uh, uh, will go forward as, as we move, move along. It's also going to change the way the payer system is. So uh, I think that uh, you know we, we tried to stop Obamacare in the Supreme Court. We tried to stop it through an election. We tried to stop it through various legislative uh, means. And uh, I, I truly think that this was was our last one of our last efforts, and we'll keep uh, trying as we go forward, of course, to, to truly turn back Obamacare. And I think also it was about the debt ceiling. As a business owner, I get it. You can't continue to have a $17 trillion debt. I mean, that would be like me walking into my office tomorrow uh, having this huge debt, and how am I ever gonna dig myself out of that? So it's also about the deficit. And uh, you know, to leave our, our, our grandchildren, and to leave our children and grandchildren that, that debt to pay off is uh, is unconscionable. So uh, the the two main reasons I think that the shutdown occurred was because of uh, Obamacare trying to stop and turn back Obamacare and trying to get this deficit uh, under control. Thank you. I agree with. 
with a lot of what was said. I think that the main issue up there were was egos. I think we had Republican and Democrat egos that got in the way. I think that, um, like it or not, uh, Obamacare is the law. There are other ways of trying to, to rid it other than this. I think what scares me the most about what happened in Washington is that it could happen in Florida. And this last legislative session that I attended this past year, this past spring, there was bickering and arguing on both sides. There was very little collaboration, very little remedial work done. And negotiations and bargaining and rulemaking never has one side wins everything and the other side loses everything. There's give and take on both sides. And when you have folks that can get together and work together and analyze the concerns, analyze the data, and then try to come to a workable solution that will benefit the most people, that's where we're going to benefit. And I think this was a wake-up call for the state of Florida. And I hope it was. And I hope we, you will send me up there because I've got experience doing those kinds of things. I have worked with our local folks, the state level, and um, worked with data-driven advocacy. And that's what we need to do to make sure that this doesn't happen in Florida. Thank you. If I remember the question correctly, it was what led to the government shutdown, is that correct? Yes, and if any of you can forget the question you want to re reiterate it, please ask. Thank you. Well, I think that the government shutdown was a symptom of a greater problem that we have in the U.S. And I think that's two things. I think that's one, the culture of corruption, and two, I think it's complacency. Up until a few years ago, American people were just busy living their lives. They were working their jobs, they were taking care of their families, and during that time, we were continually electing people into office that were not truly representing us, who had their interests in mind. And though we've worked tirelessly, I've worked tirelessly to get many of those people out of office, there's still a lot of them that are still up there in Washington, D.C. And it's only going to change when we, the people, vote them out of the office because they work for us. There's many people up there that don't have a backbone, who aren't willing to stand alone even when it's unpopular to do so. And I think in the Florida House, it's so important that we are able to collaborate, as B said, as we are able to work together on the issues that need to be worked together on. But I think that it's also important when to know to stand up for what's right. I think that the Republicans, what they started to do was right. However, they caved. They caved for us. They didn't stand up for us. And that's one thing that I will bring to the table. I will not cave on the issues where you need someone who's going to stand strong for you. I am hope to earn your vote. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to the candidates. Your next question will be, do you feel that, well, do you feel that the common core expectations will have a positive or negative impact on your state's educational system? You may begin. Do you feel that the Common Core expectations will have a positive or negative impact on our state's educational system? The expectations. Okay. Um, I think that um, the Common Core expectations will have a very negative impact in many areas. I think that, um, as we have seen, there are lots of people within the education system that are having struggling times with the common kind of core standards that are already been implemented. The students are already facing difficulties with the standards that have been implemented, and we still are not fully implemented yet. But also, I think that any time that you expect the teachers to teach to what is perceived as the test, rather than teaching the students, I think that we have some negative implications. 
Um, I think that um, it's really interesting that Florida adopted the Common Core Standards and many of us, <coughs> including even though I've been very, very active within the pro Republican Party for most of my life, I really didn't understand what Common Core was until this past year. I think there are a lot of people in the United States that did not understand Common Core and what had been created and what was happening within the school system. Jennifer said that there is a certain amount of complacency, but I would say that since 2005, when we started experiencing this economic downturn, there has been a lot of people working mercilessly trying to maintain their families and their stature and keep their families intact. I think it's been a real struggle. So I think there has been some complacency, and I think that that's one of the reasons why we weren't fully aware of what was going on with Common Core. But I also think that families have gone through a tremendous struggle during the last eight years. I talked to one teacher who was moving out of state, and she said that I, as a realtor, was facing this with many families and business owners and, and the like. But the kids in school systems have been going through the same economic downturn that we've been going through, and yet we're not realizing that they are having the same impact at their age level that we are going through. So I think it's going to really have a negative impact. Someone told me uh, a while back, like said, when your, when your grandpa was going to school, he was competing against the man down the street. When your dad went to school, he was competing against the man within his state. When I went to school, I was competing against people across the country. But my son's going to be competing against people across the world. We are a global economy, and we're falling behind. Uh, India produces more engineers than our entire country does, uh, which is unbelievable to me. So. But is Common Core the right answer? I, I don't know that it is because people don't like the fact that it comes from Washington, D.C. And they don't like any, everyone's very anxious about anything that Washington, D.C. does these days, and, and with, with good reason, because top-down government no one likes. Uh, people like those decisions to be on a local level. Uh, I know that our own legislature is now uh, rethinking the whole Common Core experience because, first of all, the cost of the testing, the computers, it's, it's a great expense to our state. So even the governor has considered reevaluating all this. I know we had a big forum over in Tampa recently, and they've, they've kind of taken a step back, and they're going to reevaluate this. Uh, but, a, but another kind of testing mechanism needs to go in its place, and that's, that's going to require, require people to get on board and, and do something quickly. If we're not going to use the Common Core standards, something has to be replaced. And, Everyone seems to hate FCAT, so our state's going to have to come up with a new program. And I think the people in the legislature are well aware of the, the citizens' dissatisfaction with this entire concept. And, and I think they're very willing to do something to hear from some of them that understand. So, thank you. Um, well, I grew up uh, in, the, in the Eustis Elementary, the Eustis Middle, and the Eustis High School. And uh, that was, you know, back in the day when, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And uh, as, as, as we've moved forward since then, we have fallen somehow behind in the educational standards. Um, as I uh, talk to uh, various employers at economic conferences, I hear all of them saying they're, they're, ha they're concerned about uh, some of the uh, hirees coming on as far as educational levels go. So I think that uh, we certainly need to address, address uh, the educational issues that are going on if, if we feel that we need to, to raise the standard. But I don't know that allowing the Washington or the top-down approach of, of, of one size fits all is going to be the answer. And I've said it before, you know, what works in, in New York City is not going to work in Tiberias. And so I think we need to be able to have the uh, ability to determine how our, our youngsters are going to be educated to some degree. But, uh, you know, 
at heart, um, I, I, I truly believe in, in education and in that in the long run, that is going to be one of the answers to our problems. And uh, I would like to see that some of this money that is, that is wasted on fraud and other areas be brought back in, into our school system. I'm a teacher. Let me tell you what I think about Common Core. Um, Common Core is a group of standards. It's not a curriculum. It's a group of standards that have been developed, not necessarily out of Washington, although it does get that reputation of coming from the federal government. It was actually <coughs> developed with um, researchers from different universities and educators putting together a set of standards that people would be able to meet no matter where they were in the United States. As a guidance counselor, I used to have students that would transfer to me, to my school, and in Lake County, we had such high standards that they were may have been maybe A's and B's in their school in another part of the country, or even another part of the state and would come to us and after examining them and checking on doing some testing, they would need remedial classes. I think we need the standard, but the curriculum is what makes us different. How we teach it would make us different from how it's taught in New York and how it's taught in Tiberias and how it's taught in Costa, because that needs to be local. What the governor and the legislature are backing off on now is the park testing. And that's the standardized test that has been contracted through Pearson, making lots and lots of our government money to formulate tests. So I'm for Common Core, the standard. I'm for local control for the curriculum and how it's taught. And for the evaluations, I have no clue. But I think it needs to be fair, it needs to be equitable, and it needs to be valid, and it needs to be reliable, and all that is yet to be determined. Thank you very much. Well, the question you asked was about the standards, but I think what the real conversation needs to be is what about the students? What is going to be best for our students? Because it's their education. And I think in Florida, we need a student-centered education. I think Common Core, is a new set of standards and it does affect our curriculum because in order to meet those standards you have to implement curriculum that includes common core. I spoke with a mom here today, her name's Joanne, and she has students here in the school. And it's affecting them. It is. And it's affecting her student. And it's not keeping it a student centered education where her student can succeed most. And I think in the state of Florida, that's what we need to look at doing. Also, I've reaped the benefits of student-centered education. I was homeschooled, and my parents had the opportunity to choose that. And I realize that not everyone has the opportunity. But the current education system that we have gave them the opportunity to choose the type of curriculum that they could use on their children and to reap those benefits. And if Common Core is implemented, private schools, homeschoolers, won't be able to make that choice to withstand the government intruding in their education for their children. It will infringe on their rights, and it is coming down from the national government. I think that Florida can do it better, and we can do it best. And so, those are my thoughts. <laughs> uh, before I ask the next follow-up question, I would just like to mention that all the audience members have a uh, chance to ask their own questions. All you have to do is get a piece of card just like this, and uh, Mr. Painter right there behind you will be passing them out. And uh, if you have a question, please turn it back into him, and hopefully we can get your question asked. And now the next follow-up question is, what are your thoughts on private educational providers meeting the same standards? Is it going to be maybe again? What are your thoughts on private educational providers meeting the same standards? Um, as Jennifer has said, my um, husband and I also homeschooled our son for a of reasons. The main reason being because of their sports activities. But also, I can remember in the 90s when we fought in the state of Florida to allow homeschooling to exist. 
exist in the state of Florida because we didn't have that option. Um, and it was critically important to many, many families to be able to be a student-centered educational system. And I think that that has, I'm hoping that we don't lose that opportunity. But in terms of private institutions maintaining that same standard, I would imagine that because the standards will be set by the government and the government is becoming very intrusive into states' rights, I think that private institutions will be demanded, and I can't imagine that they won't be demanded to meet the same standards. And I think it will um, be dependent on the private institution whether or not they will be able to do that. Because I think the curriculum will drive the education system and the standards will drive the education system. So I think that um, you know we risk losing the ability to do to homeschool, which does um, risk the opportunities for many students who do have excel in certain sports. They cannot maintain the sports regimen unless they are homeschooled. I think we might lose that opportunity as well. And I think that there are many many students who um, excel because of their um, sports activities. I also think that um, private, our kids were in private school before they started homeschooling. I think that you, as parents, we still have the choice then to decide if we want to have a Christian education or a secular education. So I would hope that Common Core does not disrupt that possibility as well in the state of Florida. I think it's critically important for those parents who do want to have a Christian education to be able to do that. So. <laughs> And I think the question was, how will it impact private education? That's the question was, what are your thoughts on private education providers meeting the same standards? Meeting? Well, personally, I don't think that's probably a problem because I have found that most of the private education usually is, is a tougher standard than, than the, the public education system from, from people I know who <coughs> send kids to private school. and. They are, they are very challenged oftentimes in those schools. I, I sent my son to a, a Christian school all through elementary school and he learned great basic um, study skills and, and it serves him very well now that he's in college. I, I never had to get on him in high school. He, he learned a great foundation, not only moral foundation, but great study habits at that school. Um, it is concerning if the standards do go across the board. It will be difficult for people at home school to probably try to comply with all the standards. And I know there's a lot of kids that, that are homeschooled in our state. Um, I'm very happy that our state recognizes that. The Florida virtual schools are, are just skyrocketing through the state. It's, it's very, very popular. We, we have a lot of different programs. You know, the magnet programs, the, the free scholarship programs for the, the children in the poverty levels. We, we, we have a lot of a lot of good different opportunities for kids in different different ways. So I'm hoping that whatever method of teaching or whatever method of education that our kids choose to go to, be it a charter school, a magnet school, that they'll be able to adapt to whatever standards our, our state puts forth. Thank you. Well, I'm, I, I'm a believer in educational choice. So as a parent uh, and as a student, uh, you essentially, in my mind, have three choices. You can choose to go to a public school, you can choose to go to a private school, or you can choose to be homeschooled. I would, I would like to hope that, that uh, if government, I mean, if being involved in a, in a public school, which is uh, taken care of by us, the taxpayers, uh, may have, certain government implementation uh, from either a county level, a state level, uh, and certainly we're fighting back the federal level. But I would not like to see those same standards applied into, into private schools and into homeschool situations. And it's, it's been my experience as well that uh, when, you know, in, in the, Capitalism, uh, you know, when you're when you're paying paying money for a private school, uh, they they tend to uh, to, to educate uh, your children, and uh, and most of them do well. Uh, that I can see when when they move on uh, in their uh, collegiate careers, 
And so uh, I would like that to not see the, the negative impact. Uh, if, if there's going to be, if public schools are going to be regulated in certain ways, I certainly don't want to see those impacts uh, take hold in the, in the private schools and in uh, homeschooling. I don't believe that um, private schools, whether they be private schools, whether they're a religious or industry-based, are held to the same standards that public schools, if I'm remembering the statutes correctly, as far as the FCAS and some of the other standards that have to be met. Sometimes they have to take them if they want to take them, and we used to have them come to Terry's Middle School and, and schedule taking the FCAS if they wanted to take them. But public schools are regulated by the Florida Department of Education. Um, private schools have their own board of directors, they have their own rules and regulations, as they should. They should not be held under the Florida Department of Education. That group should only be overseeing, well, I don't think they should go to anybody, they can't keep a commissioner. Um, but I, I don't think they should really be overseeing anybody. Um, I think that should be done locally. But private schools should have their own board, their own rules, their own regulations, they charge tuition, they set their own curriculum, and I'm all for them meeting those needs of their students and their community in any way that they can, whether it be a home school, whether it be a private school. I don't believe that they should have to hold, be held to the same uh, government mandate that public schools. Public schools, yes, they're getting, getting state tax dollars for funding, so they need to be held to a standard. Now that standard, I think, needs to be changed because it needs to be valid, it needs to be reliable, and it is not always that way. But school choice is a very important thing. I think we should hold on to it. I think we should value it. I think we should be very glad that we have it. I'll keep it short and to the point. I believe in a limited government. I think that there's a reason we have homeschoolers and private schoolers. And the government already puts enough burdens on private schools as is, and I don't think that they should put on additional burdens through Common Core. I think what you have to be careful of in understanding Common Core, from what I understand, even if we make private schools exempt from this, even if we make homeschoolers exempt from this, what's going to happen, as I understand it, is that you'll see, as this is implemented statewide, if it is, and nationally, that college exempt entrance exams will change to represent common core testing. So what you're going to have is you're going to have homeschoolers and private schoolers, even if they're exempt from the common core curriculum, they're going to be forced to be taught that in order to proceed to higher education because nationally the standards will change as well. Yeah. 
back hours to 29 and 30 hour work week with minimum wage activities that is simply not going to help us as families and, and businesses to get out of what we've been through for the last part. So I think that this is going to be the most important issue in the next. I don't think that we're out of this yet. I think we're still um, maybe several years. I know that the real estate downturn and foreclosure business started in 2005 and we've been going through that now for eight years and they say that we've gone through a million foreclosures and yes they say the pundits say that we still have a million and a half foreclosures to go through so that said to me that we have quite a few years of still going through what we've been through so i think that this is one of the things we need to do and whatever it takes to bring business to lake county and orange county that has to be the number one priority. I think the governor Scott's done a good job of trying to get jobs back to the state of Florida, but we still have more to go. Thank you. Um, I've, I've attended several meetings over the last six months. Um, it could be tourism development or economic development, and, and the common theme that I keep hearing is a reduction in the tax base, which is impacting services. It's impacting the ability to build roads. It's impacting the schools and their ability to provide busing for the students. Um, there, there's other tax cuts on the horizon, potentially for your hospital, which could impact services to the hospital. And, and the other common theme is that while there's a lot of people that love to live in Lake County, 60% of the people that live in Lake County don't work there. They, they commute to Orange County or Seminole County or some other county which means that's where they're buying their gas, that's where they're going out to dinner probably afterwards, running an errand at lunchtime. That, that's not creating a great tax base of business in, in the district, which is impacting services. So I, I think the most important thing would be to, to look at the district and say, what can we do to drive economic growth in a positive way? To bring, to get people to, to not just live here, but to work here and spend their money here and do their entertainment here. And, and those are things that with, with, with proper plans in place and proper laws that hopefully uh, a legislature could possibly be helpful in that area. Thank you. Um, I believe the, uh, the biggest uh, impact right now that I could make to uh, House District 31 would be uh, to be in the job creation business and also uh, to help figure out uh, the health care, uh, how are we going to pay for a problem. Uh, just to touch quickly on the health care problem, you know, in, in our, uh, when, when we have people that uh, don't have health care insurance and they end up at a, in an emergency room or a hospital uh, and they require some type of extensive treatment uh, and they end up racking up a, an expensive bill because they're being taken care of like they need to be taken care of. Because as, as a, you, if you show up to a hospital, they're required to see you. And so traditionally what happens is, is now on the back end, through either indigent care or through Medicaid, which is all taken care of by taxpayer dollars, uh, that, that health care bill is, is paid for. What I think we need to do is we need to get ahead of this. We need to begin to create some managed care, uh, health care uh, organizations to begin addressing uh, the care on the front end so that uh, patients uh, that enter without insurance can get the health care they need, but we're not dealing with it expensively on the back end. If we get this health care situation under control, it's going to leave a lot of stress and it's going to also uh, create a lot of revenue dollars which are going to be able to be used for uh, other services. And again, I can't tell you uh, much about to, for, to emphasize creating jobs. And uh, the more jobs we can create, the more health care uh, people, uh, employers that can provide health care for their employees. And uh, thank you. Number one on my list was the economy. We have to bring small business to Lake County and do a process. We need to bring them to the state of Florida. One 
one of the things, two of the things that um, businesses look for when they are looking to relocate and open businesses in an area, one is the education and one is the environment. A good sound education system will draw businesses with their families to a strong economic development. The environment will also bring businesses here because our lakes and our parks are recreation for our families. And if we don't take care of our education system, in our environment, then it's going to be even more difficult for us to bring small businesses and more industry to Lake and Orange County. I heard one time, um, don't make your own candle brighter by blowing someone else's out. And I think that one of the things we're doing that I've seen in Florida is we're bringing businesses here, but it's taking them away from a small town in Ohio or Indiana or Michigan or someplace else so now they have a depression going on in their local area. I would rather us build business rather than take it from someplace else. And by building our education system, protecting our environment, I believe we can do a lot to increase our economic growth. Thank you. also have to agree that it would <clears throat> be job sustainability and I think that government one they can't actually create jobs two it's not their role to create jobs however one thing government can do is hinder job creation and I think specifically for district 31 here in Lake County it's two-thirds Lake County and one-third Orange I was at a meeting recently with Harry we both heard that 60% of the people that live specifically in Lake County don't work here. And that doesn't sound very good, but I'm here to give you some exciting news. Because we talked about a lot of the issues and it makes me depressed at times. But for Lake County, something that we can look forward to, jobs that are coming in through the Wakaiba Parkway, which will soon be coming in to Mount Dora. And that's estimated to bring in many jobs to the area. In Lake County, we have a lot of service-oriented jobs. So people have jobs, but they're having to work two or three jobs to provide for their family. So it's not just job creation that we need, which is only gonna happen when the government gets out of the way and has less regulations, but we need to create an environment, which government can do, that would bring jobs here. Not only, though, do we need to try to get jobs from other places, but we need to look at the incredible talent we have here in Lake County and how we can best foster that talent for them to be innovative, for them to bring business here and create their own businesses and provide the environment where they can thrive. In Fruitland Park, which is out of this district, but a part of this county which affects it, the village is expanding, and that's gonna bring in over 2,000 other homes. That's gonna bring in more jobs here. It's gonna bring service jobs, but it's also gonna bring higher paying jobs. So I think in Tallahassee, as your representative, what I would do is bring to the table of getting government out of your way so that you can do what you do best and you can succeed. Thank you, Candace. We apologize to the audience that we're going to press the time so we can only get to one audience question. The question is, what do you do when one party simply refuses to negotiate a mile away or a highway? my way or highway type of thing. Can you stand your ground for what you believe in and compromise at the same time? Ms. Becky, you may begin. It's rough always being the first one to answer these questions. I think that what the question was asked was because President Obama refused to negotiate for so long and I would imagine that that's where that's coming from but we've also seen that with different elected officials in some cities and in the county. Um, I think that if you are a principled person that you can try to negotiate as long as your principles stay intact, stay intact and I think that we have to be very very careful to not negotiate our principles away because then we aren't who we are. So I think that you have to work as hard as you can. As we saw Ted Cruz do in this go-around, he was very principled, stay true to what he believed in,
try to effect change and move people off of um, and try to make people realize what was happening with Obamacare, but he did not sacrifice that what she believed in. And I think that that's one of the things that's missing with a lot of our elected officials. So I think that for me, it would be a try to negotiate and when you get to the point where it is going to cause you to start delving into an area that you're not willing to go, it's just time to step back and let what is going to happen happen and watch and see what happens from it. Um, I was at a luncheon recently with um, the Honorable Dan Webster and he was talking about the negotiations in, in Washington, D.C. And, and I liked his, his standards. He said, in, you're always going to have to compromise at some point to get anything done because you have the Republicans and the Democrats and if you're going to move any legislation forward, everyone has to be willing to give a little bit up. But his, his benchmark was, if, it, if I agree with everything, at least 51%, because I, I know I'm never going to agree 100% with the other guy, otherwise I'd be a Democrat. Right? But if, if I can say at least 51%, I, I'm in on that idea, then, then I'll go ahead with it. But if I can't even hit 50%, if I don't even halfway agree with them, I'm going to stand my ground and, and, and not vote. So he had kind of like an, a little internal measurement that he used to, to make decisions and feel, feel okay about um, giving up a little bit of his if someone else was giving up a little bit of theirs. And, and that's probably a, a good place to start, I would say. So that's, that's one of the things that unfortunately when you're, when you're uh, dealing with people that don't always, don't always share your, your values and your beliefs, um, you, you have to decide at what point you stop. Um, so I think I'll try to probably use the Dan Webster method for starters. So thank you. Um, well, unfortunately, it seems like in this country right now we've, we've gotten to like a 50-50 mentality. And uh, so uh, as, as Republicans, I think it, it's, uh, it's up to us to, uh, to begin to create change in this country and to begin to uh, show uh, Americans that, that our ideals and our values will help uh, move this country forward. And I think at that point, when we can begin to bring uh, more Americans on board and, and show uh, that our values and, and what we have can, can work and will work and has worked for this country, then I think uh, that's going to help solve a lot of our problems. Yes, uh, you know, every day uh, as a business owner, uh, it, it, it's, there's something uh, that has to do with compromise. And uh, when I'm dealing with uh, patients, I'm dealing with employees, certainly I'm not willing to compromise my principles or my values. But at, that, at the same time, if it's just my way or the highway, and I'm not able to be compassionate and to be able to be understanding about other points of view, uh, then it makes, uh, it certainly does make it governing difficult. So uh, I think, uh, I think as, as a legislature, as a, being a legislator in, in Tallahassee, that uh, it, it takes, it takes a, a person that can, that can walk across the aisle that can create the relationships that are needed to be able to, uh, to bring them to your side of the aisle. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk fast on this because I have a lot to say. Um, I heard Daniel Webster say the same thing in a record and I agreed. I thought what a wonderful way to start things and to work. Um, I also had heard an NPR interview uh, that was talking about Congressman, Congressman Webster and Congressman Wasserman Schultz, who was chair of the DNC, getting together and having dinners with different legislators to try to bring them together and get to know each other and try to build some alliances so that when the issues came up, there would be some level of trust and collaboration. Let me tell you what I've done with that. Uh, the last election, there was a, a young man in Seminole County, 
uh, attorney Mike Clellan, who had decided to run against uh, an incumbent who, if I even believed half of what the Orlando Sentinel wrote about this person, um, was not the fiscally responsible person I wanted taking care of our money in the state of Florida. I supported Mr. Clellan, and he won. Um, I also supported um, Dr. Karen Castor Dental. Now these are two Democrats. I followed them in the House this past year during the session. I was very impressed with the questions they asked, the logic they used. Don't agree with everything, but I believe that they're going to be somebody that we can, that I can probably work with across the aisle. And I have actually donated to their campaign because they're logical and I believe that we can work with them, not against them. I don't believe all Republicans are good and all Democrats are bad. I think it's an issue-based thing. I think your basic guidelines have to be met, though. Thank you. I think it's easy to talk about the two individual parties <clears throat> pardon me, and forget that they're made up of people. And it's important to work on relationships. You can't just ignore someone and then all of a sudden when you want something to happen on your timeline, go up to them and ask for them to help you and expect them to help you. I think specifically in the Florida House, you've seen the Republicans hold majority for a long time. And with that, there's been power trips. They hold the strings for a lot of things. And I think what would be great to see in the Florida House is what we had when we had President Tony Jennings in the Senate and Speaker Daniel Webster. When you had the civility where every piece of legislation got heard, it could all be talked about in committee, if it made it out of committee, it could come to the floor. And I think that's where we need to start, to work and bring both parties together. Just because Republicans have the majority in the House, I don't think that they should completely try to shut down everything else the other party is doing. I think we need to have a healthy debate about the issues. I don't think that we should compromise on principles, but I think we should hear what other people have to say. And most importantly, I think that it's up to you and what you want in District 31. It's so vitally important that we hold our elected officials accountable, that we write them, that we call them, that we visit them in Tallahassee. Your voice needs to be heard, and it can't be heard if you're not making it known. So I think, one, it's important to build those relationships so that you can work together for the betterment of Florida. Two, I think it's important to never compromise on your principles. And three, to listen to what your constituencies want. Um, again, on behalf of SGA, Student Government Association, and all of Liberty, really, we just want to thank you guys and obviously our candidates, because without you, we wouldn't have this special event. And I'd like to invite up Pastor Painter to close us in prayer. <laughs> First of all, I really thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this wonderful evening tonight. It's a great facility, and I'm just I'm certain that you're very proud. Um, I came here tonight and I will continue to ask each and every one of you to consider voting for me in 2014. I do believe that there is a special skill set and life experiences that I bring to the table. And having said that, I think that in Tallahassee, we do need people that have figured out how to um, be responsible to one another and to, to negotiate and to work together. And certainly when you do that all of your life being a business, that becomes your life. So I ask again for your vote, and I hope to see you in 2014. If, uh, when you have choices, you have so many choices to choose from, that's a hard decision. So you have a lot of people up here that want to want to serve you well. I have raised a wonderful son. I have owned a successful business. I have lived through good economies and bad economies. I have known the joy of marriage and the sorrow of divorce. I have had a lot of great life experiences that I feel will lend to me a good leader. I have... 